Here's something you may not know. In 1954, a few weeks before Lord of the Flies appeared in bookstores, an Ivy League psychologist devised his own real-life Lord of the Flies experiment, inviting typical American boys to an isolated spot in Oklahoma and promising three weeks of good, clean fun. But it was all a ruse to see if he could get them to tear each other to pieces, then make friends. Don't believe me? Just ask Muzaffar Sheriff. In the summer of 1954, researchers led by Sheriff, a Turkish-American psychologist, and his wife, Carolyn Wood Sheriff, drove 22 boys from Oklahoma City in two separate buses to a 200-acre Boy Scout camp in Robbers Cave State Park. The boys, unaware that another group was also staying there, settled into cabins, and a groundbreaking experiment in group dynamics began. A little background. Sheriff had grown up in a crucible of conflict. Born in Turkey's Izmir province in 1906, he lived through three wars, including World War I. After earning his master's degree at Harvard, he traveled to Germany in 1932, where he witnessed the rise of Nazism. Sheriff returned to the U.S. to earn his Ph.D. in Colombia in 1935, then spent World War II in his native Turkey. In 1944, authorities detained him and accused him of being a communist supporter. So in 1945, he left for America, for good. His experiences with conflict had an effect, but it wasn't entirely what you'd expect. Whereas William Golding, the British author of Lord of the Flies, concluded after World War II that man produces evil as a bee produces honey, Sheriff believed that the right conditions could make people behave charitably and with kindness. War, in other words, was not inevitable. Peace was possible. Make people compete over scarce resources and they'll fight. Give them a common goal or enemy and they'll work together. So, Sheriff set about studying human behavior in the wild, specifically looking at the factors that cause prejudice and attitude and discrimination and action. In 1953, he persuaded the Rockefeller Foundation to give him $38,000 to study his idea. While the robber's cave experiment would become one of the foundational studies of modern social psychology, few knew that its first iteration in 1953 failed. In that experiment, Sheriff studied 11-year-old boys at a camp near Albany, New York. But neither the boys nor their parents had any inkling of what they were signing up for. The researchers posed as camp staff, with Sheriff the caretaker. Not creepy at all. His plan was to bring them together as one big group, then split them into two factions, the Panthers and the Pythons, and work to make them sworn enemies. Then he'd flip the script by, and we're not making this up, starting a forest fire. His theory was that the groups would forget their differences and come together to extinguish the blaze. What could possibly go wrong? After a brief introduction, his assistants began the mischief. They stole items of clothing. One researcher cut the rope that held up the panther's flag. Another crushed their tent, flung their suitcases into the bushes, and again, true story, smashed a boy's beloved ukulele. But here's the thing. Despite the sabotage, the kids couldn't be persuaded to hate each other. After the clothes went missing, they attributed it to a mix-up at the camp laundry. After the pythons swore on a Bible that they didn't cut down the panther's flag, the conflict died. Pretty soon, the 11-year-olds began to realize they were all in some kind of twisted psychological experiment. Instead of fighting with one another, they turned on the <coughs> camp counselors. Hmm. This is not at all what Sheriff had in mind, and he called off the experiment. 
He also nearly came to blows with one of his research assistants, which is ironic since his team was researching conflict, but we digress. Sheriff couldn't go back to his funders empty-handed, so the following year he tried again, this time with 12-year-old boys in Oklahoma. The researchers chose 22 boys, all from white middle-class Protestant Oklahoma City families, and as before, he created two groups. The new study had three phases, in-group formation, group conflict, and conflict resolution. In phase one, researchers invited each group to spend a week doing team building activities, and the boys dubbed the groups the Eagles and the Rattlers. But this time, Sheriff kept the two groups apart and didn't even tell them there was another group in the camp. Eventually, they surmised it and became defensive about which of the camp facilities the other might be abusing. Sheriff recorded the children saying things like, they better not be in our swimming hole, or those guys are using our baseball diamond again. Things were working exactly as planned. Pretty soon, boys in both groups began asking the staff to arrange some sort of competition. Phase two, the conflict portion of the program was off to a swimming start as the researchers arranged for a series of contests with prizes attached, a trophy, medals, and pocket knives, but nothing for the losers. The Rattlers spent a day making improvements to a ball field they'd appropriated. They even discussed installing a keep off sign. Eventually, they'd attached a Rattler flag to the backstop and vowed to hurt anyone who messed with it. The staff finally brought the two groups together in the mess hall, where they reported considerable name-calling, razzing back and forth, and singing of derogatory songs by each group. Then the games began. After the Eagles lost a tug of war, they burned the Rattlers' flag. Then the Rattlers burned the Eagles' flag. I wonder where they got the matches. After the Eagles won a contest, the Rattlers raided their cabins and stole their medals and pocket knives. The two groups began insulting each other, calling one another stinkers, braggers, sissies, babies. Eventually, they objected to eating in the same mess hall. By the way, one way we know this is because Sheriff installed secret tape recorders in the mess hall to capture the boys' interactions. Now for phase three, conflict resolution. After a series of big, all-inclusive events failed to bring the two groups together, a series of food fights broke out, long story, the researchers presented a new set of problems, including the drinking water problem. They got the two groups good and thirsty. Actually, they got the eagles thirstier, withholding their canteens. Then they told the groups that someone had sabotaged the camp's water supply. The boys investigated and found rocks blocking the water line. They worked together to form a chain and remove the rocks. And when it was done, the Rattlers let the Eagles get in line ahead of them to drink. Don't forget, the Eagles had no canteens. So much for Lord of the Flies. Over the next few days, the boys again and again worked together. On the last day, they asked if they could return to Oklahoma City on the same bus and cheered when the staff agreed. At a rest stop on the way home, the Rattlers treated everyone to malts. How 1954 is that? So why is the study important? Sheriff's findings gave rise to so-called realistic conflict theory. The idea that competition over limited resources creates intergroup conflict, and it provided evidence for Sheriff's beliefs that it was possible to foster collectivism against individualism. In the 1960s, Sheriff and his wife, along with colleagues, published widely providing a model for social psychologists to look to understand group behavior. But while many observers speak of the study as a kind of proof point about how easy it is to create a real live Lord of the Flies, scholars have since concluded it's not that simple. The study actually showed the complexities of navigating intergroup conflict and collaboration. One of Sheriff's graduate students, O.J. Harvey, would later tell Australian writer Gina Perry that he disagreed with Sheriff's views that you could, quote, overcome conflict as easily as Sheriff's experiment appeared to demonstrate. In her 2018 book about the experiment, Perry writes, 
It might have been easy to manipulate a peaceful resolution at Robber's Cave with groups of children, but how could you bring about a similar result in the broader world when the gap between the haves and the have-nots was as wide as it had ever been and the discrimination was systemic? In other words, the study failed to consider the many factors at play when participants are not all from the same group. In Oklahoma, they were all young white males from similar religious, geographic, and economic backgrounds. The upside is that Sheriff's research did uncover potential interventions for ameliorating intergroup conflict. For instance, creating a shared goal required the boys put aside distinct group identities to work collaboratively to solve a shared problem. More recently, researchers have translated these findings into more productive methods for conflict resolution, using concepts such as decategorization, which emphasizes that individuals have multiple identities. This is similar to the term intersectionality coined by critical race scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. So, was this study ethical? Good question. For her book, Perry tracked down several of the subjects and found that for more than 60 years, none of them knew they'd attended a fake little fight club explicitly designed to get them to hate each other. Typically, researchers give subjects at least a vague overview of an experiment. What's also missing here is the required debriefing that happens at the end of a study, which fully informs participants about what just happened and about possible side effects. Perry managed to track down several of Sheriff's subjects by then in their 70s, though they never knew they were outdoor lab rats Perry found that all of them had an uneasy feeling about this experience. One camper, who asked to go home due to a bad case of homesickness, told her six decades later, I'm not traumatized by the experience, but I don't like lakes, camps, cabins, or tents. Escapes the Ivory Tower is written, edited, and produced by us, Lindsay Portnoy and Greg Tapo. For more information on our sources, our music, and our media, see the link below. And if you like what you heard, don't forget to tell your friends about us.